Good evening, everyone, or good morning to our esteemed guests. Uh, it's your host, Danny Hai Fong. As you can see, I am joined by Ben Norton of Geopolitical Economy Report and Carl Ja of Silk and Steel Podcasts. I think he's contributing to RT now and a frequent uh, celebrity on social media. Uh, welcome, guys. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks Thank for you, Danny. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, yes. Uh, your when you two get together, um, it's often my some of my favorite uh, podcasts and videos to listen to. So I thought getting together to reflect on 2023, what has gone on uh, in the world over this period, would be a good way to spend time. Before you get started, everyone, make sure you like the stream. Of course, that helps boost this stream in the algorithm. You can also, of course, subscribe, share this and hit that notifications bell but um you know let's get started so maybe we can start with there has been uh the annual presser uh, from vladimir putin he does it every year uh, four hours long uh, this time around i think uh, both the uh, you know journalism uh, media as well as the public uh, experts, et cetera, uh, were combined. And there are a few highlights from it, a few videos, uh, very brief on social media to play. Uh, one of the statements that he made that I do not have, but uh, perhaps you all could comment on, which has the Western mainstream media going a bit haywire, is his comments on Odessa, calling it a Russian city. There has been intimations from the West for so long that Russia is going to take Odessa at any moment. But some of the other highlights, uh, Carl, I believe you shared this. <laughs> when the New York Times and Xinhua, which is a media outlet in China, were vying for a spot to uh, ask a question of Vladimir Putin, he had this to say. New York Times. Дайте, пожалуйста. Нет, давайте мы сначала дадим Синхуа, а потом New York Times. So a bit of a dig at the uh, uh, New York Times. And then uh, he had some comments on Gaza as well, which have been making the rounds. Uh, he called Gaza the largest cemetery for children in the world. And here's what he had to say in comparison to Ukraine, which uh, many people have been making these comparisons given the, uh, the scale of the destruction in Gaza. Организации Объединенных Наций назвал сегодняшний сектор Газа самым большим кладбищем детей в мире. Но это вот такая оценка о многом говорит. So, what struck me the most about what the the statements that were highlighted from the presser, which was four hours long, mind you, uh, was the confidence, the the assertiveness, and of course the emphasis on sovereignty on independence and of course uh, uh really i think making an emphasis that russia and and really much of the world <laughs> is moving away from the west moving away from the us and from nato and from its empire but i want to kick it to you whoever wants to begin uh, maybe ben if you wanted to start yeah i think there are a few things to take away from the speech first of all uh, this comes at a time of course when it's essentially been admitted in the Western press that Ukraine has lost this war. And there are reports, I'm a little skeptical, but there are reports that allegedly people in the U.S. government are having kind of backroom deals going on in negotiations to try to potentially bring about an end to this war because they recognize that the longer they wait, the more Ukraine is going to be defeated. I mean, Ukraine has already been defeated, but it's going to be an even worse situation. And that's why, you know, there, there's a discussion now about Odessa and other areas in, in Ukraine. And if another very important takeaway from Putin's presser is that he said repeatedly 
that the United States created this problem. He was asked about Russia's relations with the West and with Europe. And he said, Europe is going along with this problem that was created by the United States. And specifically, he said, we have been saying from the beginning and even before this, this new phase of the war that we wanted an agreement with Ukraine. He mentioned the Istanbul peace talks. And he said, until they come to a security agreement and refuse to join NATO, this war is going to continue. And of course, this is not just Putin saying this. I mean, there's so much evidence at this point. But I recently did a report looking at two new pieces of evidence from October, November, which was first the former chancellor of Germany, the former head of state. Of course, chancellors, people don't know. It's like the prime minister equivalent. Um, Gerhard Schroeder from the Social Democratic Party, he said in an interview that he was involved in trying to negotiate peace between Russia and Ukraine in early 2022. He said that the Russians wanted peace. They had a series of agreements and, and their conditions were very basic. Ukraine had to be geopolitically neutral. It could not join NATO. It had to provide autonomy for the eastern regions like the Donbass. It had to, uh, to respect the rights of Russian speakers. All very basic things that were supposed to be implemented by Ukraine, let's not forget, after in 2015, there were a series of negotiations in Belarus that led to the Minsk Accords, and Ukraine was supposed to implement all of those things and refused to, of course. Anyway, the point is that Gerhard Schroeder said, the former German chancellor said in this interview that the United States controls everything in Ukraine and nothing gets done if Washington doesn't approve it. And then there were very similar remarks made by a top Ukrainian official in November, who is the head of the parliamentary faction of Zelensky's political party, Servant of the People, which, you know, is named after the TV show that Zelensky would became famous for being the star of, where he plays a teacher who accidentally becomes the leader of the president of Ukraine. And the billionaire oligarch who funded that TV show and owns the TV channel also funded his political campaign and his party named after the TV show. Anyway, the point is the parliamentary faction of that political party in Ukraine, he said in an interview with Ukraine's channel One Plus One, the same thing, that Russia wanted to sign a peace agreement in March 2022, a few weeks into this new phase of the war. And it was the Western powers that told Ukraine, no, do not sign a peace agreement. He said that the most important thing for Russia was that Ukraine does not join NATO. That was, and in fact, according to this Ukrainian official, he said everything, all the other conditions were, were not as important. The, the most important condition that Russia put out was that Ukraine can never join NATO. And, and, and what happened, according to this interview, he said that Boris Johnson came to, to Ukraine and told them, do not sign a peace agreement, fight instead. And of course, I would add, Boris Johnson would never do something like that if he wasn't being told to by the United States, because, you know, the UK is just goes along with whatever Washington tells it. So, I mean, if it's easy for the Western media to say that all of these things that Putin said in his presser are, constitute Russian propaganda. Right. But what Putin said has been reaffirmed by the former chancellor of Germany, by a top Ukrainian official. And let's not forget earlier this year, the former prime minister of Israel, of course, the closest U.S. ally of all, Naftali Bennett, said the exact same thing in an interview. He said after he, he left as prime minister and was replaced by Netanyahu, but he said in this interview that he was negotiating peace between Ukraine and Russia. And he said that the Western powers, specifically the U.S., but he also mentioned the U.K. and, and Germany, they did not want Ukraine to sign a peace agreement with Russia. And he said the former Israeli prime minister, this war criminal, close U.S. ally, he said he thought it was a mistake for them to do that. And here we see the results of that today with how many Ukrainians dead, the country devastated, and this war continuing because they refuse to allow Ukraine, the Western controllers, the U.S., which is really who's in charge in Kiev, they refuse to allow the leadership to sign an agreement. Carl, if you want to jump in. I mean, Ben. Ben pretty much covered it all. This is uh, the, the the Ukraine war is a tragedy that doesn't need to happen. I mean, by now it's it's well known. It's a U.S. it's a U.S. proxy war against Russia. Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor to Biden, he thought this was an opportunity to really stick it to Russia, but also to get the Europeans 
on U.S. side, kind of bind European onto the U.S. wagon, and 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 also force the European take the U.S. stance, including the containment of China. So that they U.S. really thought there was a, that that would play opportunistically. They thought there was a golden opportunity to both stick it to Russia and stick it to China by, you know, corralling and as a side effect is corralling the Europeans into the U.S. camp. So 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 they they, they can't think of, uh, you know, starting starting their own. And it it for a while, it almost looked like it will work brilliantly. But the problem that we know, um, I think in the article that you pointed out, Ben, ben, ben Norton, uh, that was uh, the United. The problem is the United States have to industrialize itself voluntarily. And it's it's done that because the capitalist class in the United States, in chasing the bottom lines, in trying to cut costs, uh, chasing the lower labor costs in Asia, they hollow up, hollow the U.S. manufacturing sector. Since 1970, the process started uh, even before the opening of China. Of course, after the opening of China, all the U.S. industry uh, packed up and left. And now we end up with a situation where U.S. economy on paper is still the world's largest economy nominally. But uh, and Janet Yellen goes on to say, oh, U.S. can afford to fund war, you know, in Ukraine and Gaza. But the reality is in the U.S. can. The U.S. really can. I mean, the U.S. can print money all you want. But at the end of the day, that money is not going to buy artillery shells for Ukraine. You, and the United States, despite $1 trillion spent on the defense budget, cannot produ- physically produce artillery shells for Ukraine. So it's a supply problem. And, and the Europe is facing the same problem, by the way. So, and and now, because all the major pr- uh, production is now in East Asia, in China. Um, and, and this is why they're also panicking about, about China's rise. Now, now they want to so-called de-risking and... And and, and 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 they also want to somehow shame China to side with Europe and and and, and United States in sanctioning Russia, which is they're out, out of their mind. They're they openly said our strategy is to go after Russia and then go after China. So why would China help the West to destroy Russia so they can come after China next? I mean, I, I sometimes I don't. I don't know if it's they imbibe too much of their own propaganda that they think everyone is stupid, um, but I think by this point everybody sees through their 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 charade charade and and we are at the point where where we're witnessing an accelerated timeline the the, the collapse of the U.S. imperial system. Oh, you know, especially the, the war in Gaza, I think that really exposed the hypocrisy of the West. And and I, I don't think they expected because Jake Sullivan before uh, October, he went on air and said, Middle East hasn't been this calm for a long time. And he was taking credit for it. He said, because of Biden administration, because of our efforts, so the Middle East hasn't been calm for, for this long time. So now they're being caught off guard, they have to divert their energy to support Israel. And we all know um, Ukraine or Taiwan, nobody comes even close to the golden child status of Israel in the U.S. politics. So there's not going to be much resources left for Ukraine. For Israel to continue its work in Gaza, they need Continue supply of U.S. ammunition because let's face it, Israel is not a major industrial power. They play a compartmentalized role in the U.S. empire system. They they do some research and development, but they don't have the industrial capacity to produce all the all the ammunitions they need to wage a prolonged war on the Palestinian people. And this is why U.S. Biden administration, assume after October seventh, was on board to send tons of weapons to Israel. There's That means there's less resource to go around for Ukraine. And so by now, I don't know if people saw that image of, uh, of um, Zelensky in Washington sitting with uh, Lloyd Austin. I mean, I, I, I joke, it's like Zelensky got called to the principal's office to explain his action, but that's exactly what it looks like. Now, now 
we have, I, I think the media is also preparing for the Western abandonment of the Ukraine because you now you're seeing, you have that Times article that basically portray Zelensky as this delusional person who thinks that West will back him up no matter what. Uh, in a way, it's correct, but it, it, this is all West doing, as Ben uh, correctly pointed out. I wanted to, uh, uh, I mean, yes, there definitely is a crisis on many fronts, and I think there's a, a lot of desperation here. I, we're seeing more and more stories and also efforts on the part of the United States and its European, as you can call them, vassals, partners, what have you, um, all making very concerted moves, especially in the realm of information, to change the narrative of this conflict. So uh, lately it's been stalemate. Um, there's been a intelligence assessment that we don't really know where it came from. We don't know who did the assessment. We don't really know what it says. But supposedly it's the, the big information dump was that 87% of Russia's troops have been killed in the conflict in Ukraine. And this is despite the fact that Putin during this presser said there's about 1,500 people per day joining uh, Russian forces in order to go to Ukraine and fight if they're needed. And so uh, given there's such a discrepancy and given the fact that Ukraine is having its own manpower issues, Carl, you mentioned the weapons issues. I mean, who are we supposed to believe here? I'll kick it back to you, Ben, because a lot of people would say, oh, well, Putin is obviously just lying. We're in the West. And uh, whatever Vladimir Putin says is just propaganda from the Kremlin. This is this has been predictable for well over a year. I mean, I remember early last year, or sorry, late last year, late 2022, I, I did a series of reports looking at some comments from Western officials, not high level officials, but lower level officials who said that the conflict was frozen and the, the it's been frozen for a year now. And now there is discussion, you know, there was this all this propaganda for many months about the Ukrainian counteroffensive, which was a complete failure. And it was obvious that it would not go anywhere. And now the discussion is the exact opposite. That's why Western capitals that had been opposed to a peace treaty are allegedly, again, I'm a little skeptical of these reports, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were true that in the, in the background, there are some secret negotiations going on because these Western capitals can recognize that Ukraine is utterly defeated. And the longer they wait, there is a very real possibility that Ukraine as it exists territorially, will continue to be, you know, just essentially uh, turned into a rump state. So I, I think, I mean, we can speculate a lot, but I, I think what's really interesting about Putin's speech is uh, Reuters, you know, the, the uh, UK-based international newswire, very mainstream media, they published a summary of his speech. And actually, I think they included a very interesting quote from Putin. I don't know if I can share my screen. I don't know if that can I try that. Let's see if this works here. Yeah. True. But um, this is from Reuters from this Putin press conference. And and I think, you know, th these are I tried sharing it. I don't know if you can do. Yeah. Yeah. These I'm are the quotes that. It. Yeah. These are the quotes that will be mentioned in news and, you know, news wires like Reuters. But unless you're looking for the news, you're not going to find quotes like this because they'll never be mentioned on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or The New York Times. But this is a this is a very important quote because in this in this press conference, Putin was asked about relations with the West, and this is what I talked about earlier. He said, "You know, NATO expansion into Ukraine is responsible for this tragedy." He refers to it as a tragedy multiple times. He says they forced us into these actions. What the United States conceived and organized, Europe stands and silently watches or plays and sing along with them. So he's saying very clear, the U.S. is in charge. Europe is going along with this. How can we build relations with them? And, and here's the really important quote that, again, you're not going to see highlighted. I mean, if you go, this is a very long article in Reuters that summarized the press conference. But I'm just going to read this quote. When internal changes happen in the United States, when they start respecting other people, other countries, when they start looking for compromise instead of trying to resolve their issues with sanctions and military intervention, then the fundamental conditions will be in place to restore fully fledged relations. So far, such conditions are not in place. 
but we are ready for that. As for the rules-based order, there are in fact no such rules. They change every day in line with politics and the short-term interests of those who talk about such an order. Again, these are words from Putin that you're never allowed to, again, CNN will not highlight that quote, but that's, that's an extremely reasonable observation that is shared by many countries around the world. You keep asking us why we don't improve our relations with the West. The West is the one that is waging war on us, that is trying to prevent us from having positive relations when they change their policies of domination and sanctions and war in which they believe that they should control the entire world and no other country has, has the possibility of pursuing an alternative path of economic development, alternative political models. It's impossible within those conditions to have positive relations with them. And you keep blaming us, but you never talk about what they have done. And, and that's why it's not because, you know, a lot of people, you know, in the global South, Russia is very popular. And it's not because a lot of people in the global South see the Russian government model or economic model as something they want to emulate. It's not because of that. It's because Russia is one of the few countries whose diplomats and leaders will go on the international stage and make comments like that, even though everyone in the global South agrees but many of them are afraid of making comments like that because they know that they would face retaliation by the Western powers, including sanctions, color revolutions, regime change operations. This is a perspective that is shared by the global majority. And yet the, the entire Western media frames it all around democracy and Ukraine and all this. But of course, Ukraine is symptomatic of something that's much bigger, which is imperialism. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Carl, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I mean, looks like they're all ready to throw Ukraine under the bus. I mean, uh, can I share my screen? Uh, let me yeah, see. I, I uh, so I right now, you know, we have <clears throat> we have the Washington Post uh, uh, polling up. I'm sh am I sharing? Uh, can you see? Yeah, we, I, we have I the control Washington. the sharing, but okay, <laughs> yeah, God. but I can do it, yeah. <laughs> make the magic. So Washington Post had that article basically blaming a, a ragtag group of Ukrainian team for sabotaging Nord Stream. I mean, I, I don't, they, they re, see, they really think their readership are stupid. You know, Baltic Sea is one of the most surveyed monitor area by the NATO, by the NATO, by, by the NATO. And they, they were, they're going to say, tell, tell us that, this ragtag group of Ukrainians somehow uh, carry out a sophisticated attack on Germans' vital infra infrastructure. I mean, this is bogus. But this is what's going to happen: is Ukraine like you? Ultimately, Zelensky will probably be their uh, scapegoat. You know, all the blame is going to be placed on Ukrainians for having sacrificed half their male population in this very deadly proxy war against Russia. And this is this will hopefully serve a good lesson to any other US vassals who are thinking about volunteering for another deadly war, uh, a proxy war for the interests of the United States. I mean, just look at Ukraine. What happened to Ukraine? They get kicked to the curb in less than two years. Um, you know, this is a lesson for um, governments in Taiwan and governments in, in the Philippines, um, the, the, you know, why would you, why would, would you, would you, would you want to end up like Ukraine? I mean, there's, there's no upside. There's literally no upside in this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also discuss, uh, with regard to Ukraine, uh, I, what I think is, the kind of the political desperation coming out of this. And, and now we have, uh, after weeks and weeks of talking about beginning talks about Ukraine's membership to the European Union, uh, <laughs> what transpired was, was a bit strange, or, or should I say almost embarrassing. So I don't know if you caught how these talks even got off the ground. Uh, it, and that was... They had to, uh, Olaf Scholz, the uh, chancellor in, in Germany, literally had to tell Viktor Orban, uh, a leader of Hungary, out to get out of the room. And that was his concession. He left the room. 
and they could finally get the talks off the ground. And this has been seen now as this huge victory for Ukraine. Zelensky's on Twitter making videos about how incredible it is that there's this huge step for Ukraine to enter uh, the uh, European Union. <laughs> but here in the latest article, it, I, I almost thought they replaced, because this is what happens sometimes in the Western mainstream media. They'll uh, release an article maybe too prematurely. It's a little too negative, a little too pessimistic. And then they'll scramble and you know change the headline and attempt to, to change the article altogether. But in the latest uh, report from Politico, they also emphasize that the European Union wasn't even able to agree, similar to the United States, on the latest aid package for Ukraine, and that it emphasizes also that these are just talks, that this is not a vote on membership at all. And I don't know if you all both remember, just uh, six months ago, you had Vladimir Zelensky very angry about how he was treated at the Vilnius summit, uh, the gathering of NATO in July where he literally talks about how the so-called conditions that NATO is putting in is akin to weakness, saying uncertainty is weakness, and I will openly discuss this when he gets to the summit. He ended up very lonely with the janitor mop meme and, and all of that because he had uh, apparently at that time already worn out his welcome. So uh, uh, maybe, Ben, do you want to begin just to react to this? Because I, I felt like this is just a political ploy, it feels like, uh, to uh, maybe uh, rescue the Ukraine operation to some degree. Yeah, what would it even mean for Ukraine to join the EU? I mean, what's so funny is the again, the Western media framing about this always misses the forest for the trees. The debate is always about whether or not Ukraine will join the EU. Well, if Ukraine joins the EU, what would that mean for the Ukrainian people? First of all, what, what will, will Ukraine look like if and when this war does finally end? which started in 2014, of course. The war did not start with the, the Russian you know, war in 2022, what they call the special military operation, what the West calls the, you know, un, the, uh, you know, un, uh, the full invasion without, you know, unprovoked is the term they always use, without mentioning that the war began in 2014. And specifically, the war began because in 2014 because the U.S. sponsored a coup that overthrew uh, Ukraine's democratically elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, who was geopolitically neutral. But an important element of that on the subject of the EU, what initially caused the kind of color revolution protests in late 2013 in Ukraine? It was that Yanukovych, again, the elected independent president of Ukraine, not, not a Russian puppet. He was geopolitically neutral. In fact, sometimes he carried out decisions in Ukraine that Russia didn't like, but he was not a pro-Western leader. Therefore, according to the Western media, he was a Russian puppet, because if you're not pro-Western, therefore you're a Russian puppet. That's, that's, that's the ideology. That's, the, that's how Western media outlets think, right? So Yanukovych refused to sign a, essentially what was a trade agreement with the European Union, which would have been a step toward EU membership, because it required numerous neoliberal conditions, just as countries that, that get assistance from the IMF and IMF so-called bailout, which always includes, you know, political conditionalities, including implementing neoliberal policies, privatization, cutting, you know, social services, cutting government subsidies for food and, and, and oil and, and, and energy, etc. So in the case of Ukraine, Yanukovych recognized that it would be political suicide. It would be very destructive politically for him to accept those neoliberal conditionalities in order to join or move in a step toward the EU in this trade agreement with the EU, because the EU is a fundamentally neoliberal institution that demands that all members and and especially with, you know, countries that are trade partners that are moving toward a session, they have to remove capital controls. They have to end government subsidies for certain strategic industries. They have to remove tariffs and protectionist policies that protect local industries so they can be eaten up by foreign competitors, all of these things. And if you actually care about the well-being of your, your people, of your working class, no, no rational government that is accountable to those people would, would voluntarily implement those neoliberal policies. But what we see now is this Ukrainian regime is implementing all of those and much more. I mean, 
the the shock therapy going on in Ukraine under Zelensky is, I think, one of the the less covered issues of this conflict that really needs to be talked about more. Zelensky has been implementing a kind of Pinochet style program. I mean, mass privatizations of everything, selling it off to Western investors for pennies on the dollar. There is a website on, of the Ukrainian government. You can find it online where you can find all of these bidding contracts for government property, for state institutions and, and real estate and such. And they're selling this stuff, especially because of the horrible exchange rate right now, because they're selling it in Ukraine's local currency. But of course, if you buy with dollars, the exchange rate's very favorable. I mean, it's absurd, the stuff that they're selling for pennies on the dollar. They are looting the country. Meanwhile, Zelensky, he virtually opened the New York Stock Exchange, ringing the bell digitally on Zoom. And he gave these speeches about how Ukraine is open for business. We're welcoming 200 billion, 300 billion, 400 billion dollars worth of foreign investment in the country, which is well over 100%, leaning to 200% of Ukrainian GDP. So, I mean, we're talking about Ukraine joining the EU. What will be left of Ukraine? And in order to join the EU, it's going to further continue imposing these neoliberal economic policies that have completely devastated the country. Ukraine right now has some of the most aggressive anti-labor legislation in the entire world. It is, for the vast majority of workers, illegal to form a union in Ukraine. Collective bargaining rights have been suspended perpetually. And even Ukrainian labor unions, which are very anti-Russian and support the government, even they have been publishing press release after press release warning about these devastating policies. So it's so funny because, you know, the, the West sees joining the EU as something that's inherently good. But all, it, all, all that would do is just further the suffering of the Ukrainian people who already are suffering. Carl, anything you want to add? No, I mean, <clears throat> I have no, no nothing to add to that. This, this, the, 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 the most important issue in Ukraine, just like in, in, in Gaza, is, uh, is succession, is ceasefire, is ceasefire. China has called for a ceasefire in Ukraine and have offered to negotiate a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. Russia said it was receptive to that, but again, it's a West. It's a government in London, government in Washington has shown their hostility to any ideas of a peace deal, just like what they're doing right now in Gaza, by the way. And, and when most of the world's population wants to see peace, wants to, wants to, wants to see a ceasefire happening, these uh, imperialists, they can't even make pretend that they are for peace. You know, they, even like a toothless UN resolution, which we all know, like nobody uh, give a damn, they, they would still not bring themselves not to veto a peace deal. I mean, th this is, uh, I think, the, especially with what's going on in Gaza right now, the hypocrisy of the West is, is, is wide open for everyone to see. I mean, the U.S. is losing, U.S. and its lackeys are losing tons of credibility right now. Um, and, and Ukraine is not helping because they, Ukraine was their biggest project for the last two years and it's, it's failing miserably. Uh, and, and right now it looks like the, 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 the Ukraine sponsors in Washington are ready to wash their hands because just, you know, there's no competition with Israel. Israel is America's precious, <laughs> you know, the, in Ukraine, Taiwan, whoever, I'm sorry, you guys don't even come close. Uh, to the position of Israel in American politics. So, so Ukraine is going to have to take a back seat. Um, Russia, I think everybody, any clear observers of the war uh, have come to the conclusion that Russia is winning. And, and we are not, not talking about uh, when uh, or if. We're talking about how much, what does the Russia winning mean? You know, whether the Russia winning means uh, it, it holds the uh, um, it holds the current line, or or does it the mean that Russia will go all the way to Odessa? Because it it, uh, it, it right now you, it, it, ha it has been a frozen conflict because Ukraine has been 
offering its male population on a massive sacrificial altar with the material support from, from NATO. And now the NATO support is drying up. The, the manpower of Ukraine is also drying up. So how long can Ukraine hold the line? I mean, if, if Russia decide to uh, uh, launch their own offensive, I don't think there's anything left in Ukraine to, 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 to hold the Russians back. I mean, if, if Russia does go ahead and take Odessa and turn Ukraine into a land, landlocked state, um, it, Ukraine is basically done for. It's going to be a, a rump state. I mean, Europe might still um, put some minimum support into Ukraine like they do in Kosovo right now. Um, but it, it would... I mean, Kosovo is not the most hopeful model. It's 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 still after years of NATO occupation. It's still a land of lawlessness, <clears throat> high crimes, un, unemployment, and, uh, and 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 the 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 best hope for the, for Ukraine is uh, immigration. Go go get out of the country and go to go to Europe. And uh, you know, in we'll have to see how they fare in the increasing anti-immigration uh, sentiment of Europe today. How you know how how long they're gonna <coughs> uh, be welcome in EU, uh, which is really sad because that just means the Ukrainian people has been has been they were the human sacrifice. They were the human sacrifice for the altars of U.S. empire, um, but. Luckily, we may be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel because um, I, the, the current U.S. imperial system is just not sustainable, just like we, we we're seeing in Gaza as well. Carl, when you brought yeah, up a uh, wash. Yeah, oh, no, can, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I jump in for one second? I just want to mention that, you know, as part of the move toward Ukraine joining the EU, we should also look at not only I mentioned, you know, the neoliberal conditionalities imposed on the country, the mass privatizations, uh, the attack on, on labor unions and such. But we should also talk about the relationship between Ukraine and the EU and what that economic relationship looks like. I mean, Carl mentioned a key point, which is brain drain. This is a key problem we've seen across Eastern Europe after the overthrow of the Soviet Union and the other Warsaw Pact socialist states is there's massive brain drain People, anyone who was trained in, you know, a scientific discipline or engineering or medicine, they went to other parts of Europe or migrated to other countries around the world in, in search of higher wages, while the countries in Eastern Europe in the 90s were imposing these horrible neoliberal shock therapy programs that bankrupted the population. And what we see in Ukraine is, again, in addition to the, the physical deaths of thousands and thousands of young Ukrainians, we also see the death of the society because so many people are just leaving the country. And if Ukraine joins the EU, which also includes freedom of movement, we're going to see a very similar phenomenon where basically any Ukrainian with an advanced education is going to leave the country. It's going to turn into, I mean, we've seen countries like Bulgaria, for instance, which have been completely devastated and just emptied of their population. And, and also, let's look at the economic relationship between Ukraine and the EU. So basically what's happening, you know, Ukraine is often referred to as the breadbasket of Europe, right? It has a lot. It's one of the world's largest producers of wheat and corn and agricultural products. So what we see is we were talking about deindustrialization going hand in hand with neoliberalism is deindustrialization. And Ukraine used to be a major producer of of machine parts and heavy machinery and tractors and, you know, all of these things, especially in the Soviet era, but even until the past 10, 20 years, it had a big manufacturing sector. It produced a lot of metals. It produced a lot of chemicals. Now what we're seeing is that Ukraine is basically just becoming a kind of agricultural export hub in the same way that, you know, in the European colonial era, they turned countries like India or what at that time had been, you know, the Indian subcontinent and just these resource extraction hubs for agriculture. So now Ukraine has these, these since the the um, Poroshenko regime in Ukraine after the coup in 2014. Poroshenko was the, the billionaire right-wing oligarch. He signed, he did eventually sign a, uh, an, an economic agreement with the EU for free trade. And now what we see is that Ukraine is sending these agricultural products to the EU. And 
while the EU is fueling this process of deindustrializing the country. So what we also see is a kind of economic colonization of Ukraine and the relationship between Ukraine to the rest of Europe is like the relationship of Europe to its colonies 200 years ago. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what happened to much of Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They are now economic colonies of, of, of Germany. And the, the EU, it, it, that, that's a part of the plan incorporating EU into, I mean, Ukraine into EU. But right now we have like a multifractal level of cannibalization. The, 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 the Europe has feasted upon the carcass of the former Soviet Union and its, its ally states in, in Eastern Europe. But right now, United States is cannibalizing its allies in Europe. Yeah. Like, like this is a this is a fractal relationship of the imperial hierarchy. So you know you you have you have Germany treating the Eastern Europe as its economic colonies, but at the same time, you, Germany itself is militarily occupied by United States. And and during this war, when you know, Europe was forced to stand with U.S. in sanctioning against Russia, Germany got cut off from its cheap source of, of, of natural gas supplies from Russia. So now all the German industrialists are decamping. They're offsourcing their indus German industries now to United States. So U.S. is essentially cannibalizing its own allies in, in order to stay, you know, USA number one. And, and the European elite are so cucked. They, they, they are. They, they cannot say no to United States. They follow along with this plan. Uh, plan. You know, you have von der Leyen, you have Joseph Borrell. These guys are just nothing but a uh, 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 like spokesperson for Washington interests in Europe. Nobody, nobody in the European leadership has a backbone to stand up to United States and say no, and 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 and, and do what is actually right for the interest of the Europeans in EU. So, but this, this system is not sustainable. You know, like this multiple, multiple level of fractal cannibalization process. Uh, it, the, the, the empire is eating, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's consuming everything in its path, including Americans, including average working class Americans, because Americans are not getting health care. They're not getting great education. All the, all, the, all the monies they print is going directly to the military industrial complex, uh, feeding all the fat cats, lobbyists in Washington and, and all the hanger on all the think tankers they sponsor. And, and for the rest of us, the best they can do is uh, the poverty. Uh, the U.S. poverty alleviation plan is basically military service <laughs> you can you can join them a u.s military that's a, that's a u.s power poverty alleviation plan um I, I think people are start to see through that like i think ukraine war has opened uh, up a lot of people's eyes in the united states even among like the right-wing circles right i mean like right now like opposition to U ukraine war is almost across the political spectrum <laughs> both the left and the right says this is a bad idea but the delusional leadership in washington who are so cut off from the average reality of Americans. They're still dead set on pursuits, their, their imperial uh, pursuit, because that's what fattened their own pockets. And, and ultimately, that's very short-sighted. Uh, uh, so we, 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 the, the, Ukraine pro the Ukraine project is failing. It's, I, there's, no, there's no end in sight. I mean, I, I don't see a, a win quote unquote, a win for for NATO or EU in this point, uh, other than maybe just their, um, uh, their, you know, if they just want something, they, they, they just want a thorn on Russia's side to bleed Russia, uh, drag Russia into a quagmire. But I don't think their own economy could support that because we have seen uh, you know, because, because of deindustrialization in both United States and Europe, they can, you know, the combined mind of NATO cannot even supply simple thing as artillery shells for Ukraine. I mean, after all the deindustrialization of the, the destruction of the Soviet military industrial complex, Russia can still outproduce uh, United States and Europe 
in terms of you know basic tanks and artillery shells. So so we, we this uh, it, it all really it really shows the U.S. imperialism ultimately is a paper tiger. And yeah, I just Danny, wanted to. Can I just have oh, one brief, yes, one brief yes, comment. Yes. 